This is the Mid-America PTTC podcast, where we believe prevention is better together and together we are stronger. I'm your host, Steve Miller. This is episode 52, and in today's podcast, I have the pleasure of speaking with Marcia Baker. Marcia has a PhD in psychology with a specialty in health psychology behavioral medicine. She is currently owner of Third Coast Counseling and Wellness, where she is a practicing therapist. She has developed programs and worked as a therapist in the substance abuse treatment, prevention, and behavioral health field for over 30 years. She utilizes her education and experience to provide a holistic approach when treating emotional, physical health issues for all ages. She is a registered yoga teacher and has been a yoga practitioner for over 25 years. Before we get into the content, we would like to thank our funder, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. Quick note, although funded by SAMHSA, the content of this recording does not necessarily reflect the views of SAMHSA. We've got a lot of ground I'd like to cover today, so let's get started. Well, welcome to our podcast episode, Marsha Baker. We're certainly glad to have you here today. I'm excited to have a conversation with you um, about critical periods in an individual's life. But before we get into that, uh, the first question I always am intrigued by is, how did you one day decide, well, I'm going to pursue a career around prevention? What was your path into prevention? So it's, that's an interesting question, Steve. I, uh, I've been in the field for 40 years. So a very long time ago, I was working in really mental health and substance use before prevention really had a name. And then when I moved uh, to Texas, we were applying for grants. I was working with a nonprofit and we were applying for grants and I went to a grant funding opportunity presentation on prevention in the 90s. And it was talking about prevention in a way that I had not ever really heard. And there were only a few curriculums back then that were approved. So I went back to my office and told the people that um, would help me write grants that we need to apply for these prevention grants. And they asked me, what are they? (laughs) And I said, I'm not sure exactly, (laughs) but it does have to do with helping kids from used from using drugs. And I think that's something we need to get into because we were already um, doing substance use treatment at the time. And so we applied for a grant and we got it. And we utilized a one of the curriculums that was the only one of the only ones that was available back then. And then we also um, applied to do another curriculum in the summer, uh, which I'm a trainer for now and have been for 20 years. So it really was a pretty wonderful opportunity for me to get into actually preventing substance use um, and also mental health issues from beginning. Yeah, that's fascinating. And it, you know, I think sometimes we, we uh, don't understand just how new this industry of prevention really is. I mean, I think that historically people have been trying to prevent substance misuse for a very long time, but as kind of a a discipline and and maybe uh, as you kind of talk about it, maybe how it's kind of evolved just in the last 30 years or so, it's really fairly new. It is, right. So recently I was at a conference and I, uh, I heard you present on critical periods um, in an individual's life. And uh, I, I kind of have a fascination. I, I, I love the developmental assets and, uh, and, and the thoughts along you know, various, various stages in an individual's life, but really hearing you kind of drill down on the critical nature of these periods and, and um what that means for the development of an individual was was fascinating to me, and so I'm I'm very uh, thankful and grateful that you're able to to share a little bit with us today. So let's kind of start with like give us an overview of what is meant by those critical periods. Maybe pepper it with a few examples so we kind of have an idea. Okay, sure. A critical period really is when a, a physical or emotional event occurs um, for normal development, and so for example. Um, 
a critical period would be in a, in a would be postnatal life when the brain develops plasticity. It's dependent upon experience in the environment around it. So when a baby's born into the world, um, and and also I mean really literally in utero is a critical period for that baby. But for those nine months, um, everything is being developed that's going to make them fully functional as a, um, a, a baby when they come out into the world. So that early development period, and really the last trimester has a lot to do with brain development and kind of getting things prepared. So that last trimester for that baby is extremely important. And that mom's, uh, everything the mom eats and food and you know that goes in, and that is a critical period for a development for before a child even is born into the world. And then once they are born, um, that, that the attachment um, really is important and also the nurturing. And I, one of the, like one of the, the issues that can come about for a, a newborn is if they are not being nurtured and not given what they're supposed to be given, then they're going to not trust or not know what to expect. And so it's interesting that even a newborn's and a, um, a young baby's face will have no expression on it if it's not being given um, what it needs. So that, that is a critical period. Actually from zero to three is considered a critical period in a, in a child's life because so many, so many different aspects of development are gonna be starting to come on. And when that isn't, when that isn't being given an opportunity to be um, nurtured in a in a healthy way, then those are going to be lacking in in a, a lot of ways. So that that is a period. But then we get each each developmental stage has a critical period. So once we get into from like uh, three years up until about um, five years of age, then of other areas other aspects of that child's life are gonna be coming on. So every developmental stage has a critical period. There are, the interesting thing about that critical period, there's another period called a sensitive period when a physical or emotional event happens, but it's not critical. So a sensitive period is when that something is supposed to happen, but it's not as critical as some others. So like, um, being able to, when you get to be about five or about from five on to about um, seven years of age, you develop, you, you get involved with other people and then you have interactions with other people. And that would be a critical uh, phase because without those interactions, you're not going to be able to develop like how to make friends, you know, how to talk to other people, how to, um, how to get along in your environment. And so like children that are isolated from that, and that's one of the reasons that the pandemic was so difficult is that that isolation kept us from helping kids develop those critical periods and those sensitive periods. And then one of the things that I, um, that I found really um, that's pretty interesting is that another critical period is like teenage years when you are literally from about 12 to 13 years of age up until about 20 some, that's when your identity is forming about who you are as a person. So if you have, like, for example, if you don't do well in school, you um, like one of your, if your, your parents get divorced um, and you're a part, you know, there's a lot of drama in it then, you, or let's say that you uh, played sports, then you got injured. Cause I've seen this happen a lot. You get injured, but that sport was your whole life. Then that, that really challenges your critical period of identity. And then your sexual, your, your identity as a female or male. And then with all the the, the ways that we sexually identify ourselves, because that's when all those hormones start to come on. And so if you have been, um, you know, had trauma um, 
from sexual abuse, for example, or physical abuse, that is a big critical period for you because how does that define who you are as a person? And then it get, keeps going on, like critical periods keep going on into our adulthood. Um, when as young adults, that's when we develop relationships with people. And that's when we, um, um, we when Erickson and um, Piaget came up with a couple of pretty, pretty important uh, cognitive and then so, uh, psychosocial development. And so when we get into our young adulthood, we are looking at, first of all, what is our identity as a person who's going to work? How are we going to support ourselves? And then are we going to, how are we going to be as people? Are we going to have partners? Are we going to have children? So that, that can actually be challenging if some of those, that is not happening for us. And then once we get into middle age, middle age is where you are in the, you know, we talk about middle age crisis, that's a critical period, because if you've not been successful, for example, as a person, or you feel like you haven't, that's really your, it's, it's our own individual identity, then that critical period about how we feel we have been as a, a person is a critical period. And then obviously older adult is like six dish on up, then where is uh, it, are we still viable? Are we still needed by people? Uh, there's a, the, that period is called generativity versus stagnation. And so are we successful um, at who we are as people? So those are all critical periods through our life span. It doesn't stop, you know, from the time when we're very young. <laughs> Now, as you kind of describe some of those, I mean, whether they're critical or some of those more sensitive periods, and, and I'm assuming I, 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 I'm going to assume I kind of know the answer, but just to, to put it out there, there's, there's a lot that goes into human development. And I mean, let's say someone doesn't have these critical periods met during uh, th those adolescent uh, years. Is that the role of therapy later on? Or in some cases, is this something that individuals will probably struggle with throughout their life course? Individuals, therapy would be fantastic because if you get a, a, a teenager into therapy early enough, they actually can get help so that their um, psychosocial development doesn't turn into a critical uh, diagnosis. Um, and, I've, and I've worked with people that, uh, young people that um, really have made great strides and their families have made lots of changes um, to help that young person. But if they don't get help, they will, they will struggle and sometimes not get help for a very long time. And a lot of times being placed on lots of medications have a lot either, um, both physical and or mental health issues. So because our whole body's involved, it's not just, you know, our brain. So our, our, our issues that we have begin to impact our health as well. So in regards to, we're talking about prevention work here today. So in, in regards to that, what's the importance of being able to identify these critical periods? I, is it, is it as, is it as big a deal as I want to assume it is, or is this, you know, it, what is the, what is the importance of being able to identify them? So it, it is, all your curriculums are evidence-based with theories and theorists that have found these, these human development um, ways of improving upon and giving them universal methods that will help um, kids develop um, in ways that are healthy and important. So across the board, you know, most, uh, most of our, our evidence-based, you know, programs develop universal skills. And then there are some that are more of the, um, the, the more, the skills that are close to therapy, but not quite. And so depending upon where you live, you know, one of the things when I do a training in child and adolescent development, I actually have people think about where they live and the schools they're going into, what are those uh, children's lives like? 
because not all kids are going to be experiencing. So they're all going to be experiencing the same human growth and development um, transitions. Mm -hmm. But the depending upon where you live, the 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 environment is going to play a large role in what that child's life is like. So if you know that uh, if you're working with kids from junior high all the way up through high school, you're going to you're going to know that that's a critical period. And so your your lessons that you are um, developing and and um, and uh, implementing, you're going to be looking at identity because identity is what those kids are going through at that point. And so in your they're going to, you know, communication, all those kind of things are great. But forming their identity, forming who they are as a person is going to be what you focus on. And if you can focus on that for those kids in those communities, then um, you're going to be doing a great service because you're going to be also looking at, you know, the um, the structure of the community. Are there is it easy access to go to college? Is it easy access to start apprenticeships, you know, in work life or do you live in a community that's very uh, limited? And so kids don't have, and, and their parents don't have the opportunity to really send them away to go get these ways of, of supporting themselves and becoming you know, who they are as people. So thinking about that um, is gonna be important for you as a person who implements the curriculum. So as you're talking about that, I'm thinking, you know, there's a, uh, you said, is there is there the availability of of you know mentorships or the access to go to school? Um, I'm assuming then, easily enough, the correlation here is is that if some of these developmental periods aren't met critically, um, then it kind of opens the door to um, substance misuse. Yes, and 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 that my the what came through my mind was, is, you know, the debate in, 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 in addiction and recovery is, is it nature or nurture? You know, what's the, what's the, uh, which came first, the chicken or the egg, but, but in identifying those, those needs, I, I'm assuming then what we're looking at is um, being aware of that so that we can have prevention measures in place in our families, in our communities, society, that counteract, I guess those are those uh, those uh, pre- prevention um, efforts or those uh, protective factors. Is that right? It is right. Family intervention curriculums are really um, wonderful because they so they give the family the support they need and the information they need so that they can be of better help to their children. Really, I honestly believe that every family should be able to get a family-based intervention, evidence-based curriculum um, in, in, in the United States. I really, I just think that uh, my dream would be if every baby born, that that family would walk out of there with an evidence-based curriculum that they would be uh, working on as they raise their children, because those really, um, they help all of us. They're not mm-hmm. just for, you know, families that have challenges. It's for all of us. Right. So I'm assuming that some of the expertise that you have, and you said that you've been teaching a particular prevention program for a number of years. Is that a, is that a family-based intervention program? Can it you is. tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, it's, um, it's actually Strengthening Families, which has been around for um, 30 some years. And I've been actually training it for the last 22 years. Um, And I I actually raised my own children with that curriculum. Um, Mm -hmm. Honestly, had I not, I don't think they would have fared as well. And I don't think I would have either. Um, But I'm a, I've, I've also been involved in their research with their clinical trials. um, And, and had, I was, we had a group where I live um, of families that was uh, one of the research-based cohorts. So I'm, I'm very familiar with, you know, all the skills that it teaches and it just, and there's a lot of really good programs out there now that um, are, you know, um, very helpful to families. And some of them even are involved nurses that go out to the homes 
of um, families and nurses help mm -hmm. mothers, uh, you know, care for their newborns uh, right from birth. So I just think that the, these kind of curriculums are um, really helpful for all parents. Can you tell us maybe just an overview of if uh, for those that may not know what is strengthening families like what what does that consist of? So strengthening families is an evidence based program. It is actually um, uh, 12, 11 sessions, and um, we what we start out with is we start out with bonding. So the very first the very the first three different well three three to four. Um, modules are based on how to bond with their child. And this is also um, a, another evidence-based, um, what we teach is called um, child's game or my, my time. And we actually teach parents how to spend one-on-one -on -one time with their child. This is, this, this has actually been proven as a, as a just in of itself, just learning how to spend time with your child one-on-one um, -on -one is a, a, um, a protective factor because you're giving your child undivided attention. Most of us only give about the, the average amount of time that has been found that we spend quality time with our children is about five minutes a day. Um, and that's because we ask questions, we, um, we tell them what to do. Those are really what parents generally do. So spending my time with a child is actually listening to them, involving yourself in their life, in their world, and not asking questions of them and not telling them what to do for about 10 minutes a day. So that's my time. Um, there is, then we go into monitor uh, boundaries. So we, then we help families set up rules and we help set up rewards and consequences. And so that really is another segment that's about three to four sessions that we just work on families looking at what are their home rules? Like, what do we all adhere to in our home? And then um, what does each child have as their own rules? Because they're all different, they're all unique, different ages. And then what, what are the rewards for each of those children? And what are the consequences? And kids are involved. We have a family meeting every week and a family, we teach them how to do that. Um, and then children can interact with their parents in a healthy, productive, like I have power too. I'm not just your child, but I have, um, I have power in my home. And then last, we spend the last several sessions on monitoring. So as kids get older, how can parents monitor their children's behaviors? The, there's a kind of a motto, uh, trust, but verify. <laughs> so we, we want to trust you, but we want to verify that you say you're doing what you're doing. And one of those lessons in those uh, monitoring is substance use. So it's talking about substances and what we you know, as parents don't want our children doing. So that, that really is kind of, um, you know, bonding, boundaries, and monitoring. Those are the kind of the three big key holds. And then also child's my time, and then also um, family meeting. The research shows after 10 years, if families have been doing this, then they still have those components and their families are doing pretty well. Hmm. Fascinating. I, uh, I kind of wondered if that was the, the kind of the curriculum It's much more um, intensive. I'm familiar with the guiding good choices um, format and a, a lot of what you were explaining is embedded in that, but it's a, it's a shorter time commitment. I think you, I think it was about five or six weeks. So about half of what uh, strengthening families is, but um so you're a professional, you're also a therapist. So you're working a lot in identifying these critical periods. You know, you've kind of understand the, the application of, of uh, you know, therapy to, for those that missed out on some of those critical stages. Um, and then you have some understanding of trying to prevent or work through that with some of the programming that you're doing. What if I'm just, uh, uh, I'm a, a coalition member in a community that really wants to do something good for, um, uh, for, for, my, for my town and I, and I want to do some drug prevention or maybe, you know, violence reduction or something along those lines. What, what are we looking for, for the, during the delivery of prevention at that level? Like, what is it that I need to know kind of the nuts and bolts that um, might help me in understanding this thing called prevention at the kind of that grassroots or community level, 
but at the same time builds in this awareness of these critical periods in a person's life. So one would, you know, one would be as what is your community like? You know, what are your um, risk factors in your community? And what are your protective factors? What, do you, what good stuff do you have going on already? Most communities mm -hmm. have some kind of good stuff. And so what you want to build on is those, those, that good stuff, but you also want to put in some things that with that good stuff that would help decrease some of those risk factors. So for example, if you have a lot of like rural community, um, but parents both work, and so you have a child coming home and there's not a lot of resources in your community for kids to experience um, good, healthy social relationships with other kids. So, so you might want to involve some community members that could help support um, kids having activities um, that would encourage healthy uh, engagement and that would be monitored you know, what, by other members of the community. Because a lot of times with substance use, for example, kids get involved in it because there's not a lot of other things to do. And they do that together. So if you can actually provide activities that a, a large groups of kids can, can access easily, then that would be um, really positive. Also in your community, if there's um, not a lot of um, ability for mentoring or there's not a lot of ability for jobs you know for um for them then helping community members to create jobs for summertime so that kids would be able to get opportunities to see what certain jobs are like or mentorships where you know they actually work beside someone may not even get paid but you have a place to go you know every every you know couple of days a week that you have responsibilities so you know, your, each community is going to be different, but you want to look at, you know, the level of what, what you see are problematic, what are the problems, and then look at what you can do to build in protective factors to decrease those problems, and then look at the kids, the ages of the kids that have the issues. So if both parents are working, they're not going to be, they're not going to, there's a lot of little kids that aren't going to get a lot of um, attention. So how are you going, what can you do? Like maybe have after school activities. And in the summer, they have um, activities that maybe you have the schools open. I know some schools actually open up in the summer and they feed their kids, you know, lunch. And then they have like one or two hours where they, you know, somebody in the community is there at the schools that, you know, um, monitors the gym, you know, and then, uh, so kids can go in and play basketball. And then, uh, you know, some of the community centers that are around, you know, you, you have volunteers that actually go and, and help. So it really, every community is gonna be different, but it really is looking at the risks and the age groups that are most at risk. Easy way of doing that is, you know, as, as getting involved with the schools and asking, you know, what the school's issues are during the school year and then, also going to the police department and finding out what kids are being, you know, picked up for or uh, what they're seeing. And then, then you're going to get some good data on what your risks are. Mm -hmm. Well, immediately what comes to mind is, um, is there a, uh, a favorite resource that you might um, share with our audience, either a, a book that might help to better understand what we've been talking about or uh, a website that um, someone uh, who's interested could visit and just to, to get more um, familiar with critical periods and some of the work that uh, you've been describing? Well, one, you know, there is a theorist, um, Brothen Brenner's Ecological Systems Theory. Um, if So I'll spell it. Um, uh, it's uh, B-R-O-N-F-E-N-B-R-E-N-N-E-R-S. So it's B-R-O-N-F-E-N-B-R-E-N-N-E-R-S, Brothen Brenner's Ecological Systems Theory. And I really like this theory and a lot of other theories are built around this. And it's really for coalition members, it would be really helpful because mm -hmm. you it has the child in the center and then you have a circle around the child and that's called a microsystem. And the child has school, peers, 
neighborhood playground, daycare facility, religious organization, health services, family. Okay, so that's the my, that's what's around that child. And then you have the what's called the exosystem, which is the next circle. And this is extended family and neighbors, school board, government agencies, social services, uh, and health care, mass media, parents' economic situation. So that's exo. And then you've got the macro, which is attitudes and ide ideologies of culture. So that's the culture that that child and all mm -hmm. those people are, are around. And then the outside is called the very last circle. It's called the chronosystem. And that's environmental changes that occur over the course of that child's life. Okay. Fascinating. Yeah, okay. so Broffenbrenner's ecological systems theory, it really mm -hmm. was kind of developed in 2004, but a lot of theories kind of go around this theory for more of, and this is really a lot to do with prevention. Well, we'll put a, a hyperlink in the show notes so people can uh, um, maybe find more information. And I uh, also thought I'd share a little bit about the strengthening families. Um, I'm kind of curious um, as we uh, end up our time here, is there, I, whenever I do a presentation, I always end with some variation of saying, tell three people what you learned here today. Um, is there a call to action or is there um, a, um, a particular thing that you would want to say, I hope that the audience knows this um, now that we've had this conversation? Well, I, what, I, what I do want to say is that we have just came through a critical period as almost like a planet, um, which is the pandemic. And so I want to share that this is a critical period for all children that have come through this because it has changed the way they view the world. And so understanding that it is not the way we used to be. Mm -hmm. We have, and, and so from a prevention perspective, you know, thinking about your community and what's happened there um, is huge. And so, and little children, if you think about, I, and I talk to the, I talk about this with a lot of kids that I see is that they started two, three, almost three years ago now for example, in grade school, and now they're almost out of junior high, ready for high school, and never really went to junior high. Mm, yeah. So if you think about that, they skipped junior high completely. Mm -hmm. um, or first grade, like if they started in first grade, they now are in fourth grade. And they missed all of those years of developing those social relationships so I see a lot of children with um, major um, anxiety, um, not knowing how to communicate with each other, uh, not knowing how to, um, to be nurturing to each other and have relationships. And then just the maturity level of going, uh, completely skipping junior high and going to high school, a lot of kids their maturity level from an emotional perspective is not what it could have been and what would have been had they been in school. Thank you for that thought. That really is uh, a lot to consider. And, uh, and I think that what helps me and hopefully others is to, 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 is to understand we all went through this together. So it's not just happened to some people It happened to all of us. So, right. yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Thank you for being uh, my guest today. And uh, we'll put uh, some show notes in there and uh, any other websites that uh, we might think of. And uh, um, we do appreciate you being a guest today. And uh, thank you for being here. Thank you so much. It was really enjoyable. Thank you for listening to this Mid-America PTTC podcast. To learn more about any upcoming trainings, visit pttcnetwork.org and look under your PTTC for the Mid-America link. Remember, prevention is better together and together we are stronger. Stronger.